we're going to find out if the stories here are true or if they're BS. We're here to find out if this place is real or if it's BS or if it's just BS. BS. Or if they're all BS. Welcome to this episode of BS Paranormal Investigations. So this episode is more about an overview of an investigation I did a few weeks ago. You might have saw it on my Instagram, Facebook, um, where I was at the Plains Hotel in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So actual footage of my investigation may or may not air in coming weeks, depending on um, the owner's discretion. The reality was when I came in for the investigation, um, I was misled by an employee my first night there. Um, she led me to believe that I could conduct a paranormal investigation on my own uh, terms. And it wasn't until the following day where I spoke to management, like I normally do, get some of the stories, get some of the uh, information about the paranormal activity that supposedly goes on in my locations. Um, she informed me that due to a paranormal investigator who came prior and and kind of broke some of the hotel rules, that all paranormal investigations have to go through the owner and the owner has pretty much soured on um, other paranormal investigators. But I figured I would go ahead and air something while I'm waiting for a response from the owner. Um, again, I'm not going to show any pictures. I'm not going to show any footage, but I do want to talk about the hotel itself and some of the things I experienced again, just as kind of an episode to, um, kind of placehold while I, uh, find out the answer, um, to whether or not the owner will allow me to use footage from the hotel. So, I showed up a couple of weeks ago um, amidst a sinus infection. So while I was there, I was not 100%. I know it wasn't COVID. I know it wasn't the flu. I tested negative for both uh, multiple times. But I did uh, have some sinus and like allergy issues while I was there. And I, like it, it was actually a lot uh, on the second night. But I arrived and uh, the employee checked me in and told me that while she can't be on camera, I was free to do a paranormal investigation. Again, as I previously stated, I was very much misled on this. Um, and one of the things I like to do when I'm staying multiple nights in a location is take the first night and actually be a guest. Um, just kind of hang out there, enjoy the place, go to my room, watch TV, have a few drinks if they have a bar or a restaurant. Um, just really lay back a little bit and take in the location. And there was so much to take in. Um, this hotel is awesome <laughs> in terms of history. It is set up like a museum in a lot of ways. They have artifacts throughout the building um, on multiple floors, on various floors. Every floor has different stuff. Um, I did refrain from going in, uh, to the third and fifth floors because I didn't have rooms there. Um, I was on the fourth floor, so I did take a look around there. Um, the second floor has like a banister area in the lobby that you can take a look at uh, artifacts that are uh, put behind casings. Um, they have old pictures, old documents. Um, it's a very special place. Like it's a place you go into. It feels like the West and you get this sense of history. It is on the historic registry. Um, so like if you want to look up the high, uh, the Plains hotel and, uh, see the history behind it and kind of, get familiar with the building's uh, history, that information's public. So like, I found it very, very fascinating in that sense. Um, the other side of it is the hotel room where I was staying. Um, again, I was staying in one of the two most haunted rooms in the hotel. 
444. I was staying in 444. Um, the story goes is that on a couple's wedding night, the husband hooked up with a prostitute, and the wife uh, killed the three of them. Uh, she shot the husband, shot the prostitute, and then killed herself. Um, then there's the story of a ghost boy who haunts the stairway. I did try to take the stairs most of the time I was there just to see if I can uh, find anything. Um, in terms of my experiences in room 444, I did have three things that stood out to me. Um, throughout the whole hotel, I had a total of five things. So three of them come from the room, two of them come from outside of the room. Um, again, I'm not so eager to chalk them up to paranormal as much as I am just these things happened and there's multiple explanations for what they were. Again, part of our channel is to allow you to decide rather than us just tell you what we think it is and try to put that impression on you. Um, the first thing I experienced was actually on night one, and it wasn't something I realized I experienced until day two. Um, and that was this interesting smell. I caught it in my room um, first, and then I smelled it in the hallway, but I never smelled it outside of those two times. Um, and it, it was interesting. So like the smell was that of like fruit punch and whiskey with like this cologne -ish essence to it. Um, if you ever smelled cologne or perfume, you know there's a like alcoholy, like herbally type smell, like fermented herbs that break through whatever scent is there in the cologne or perfume. Um, and this smell had that. Um, I do not wear cologne. I don't wear perfume or anything like that. I am pretty simple in those terms. Um, so to smell this in my room and then the next day actually smell it in the hallway and then have that experience uh, kind of supported by the management who also um, witnessed a smell akin to it. Um, that was that was pretty significant for me. It's the second time I've ever experienced that kind of a phantom smell type thing. Could it have been someone in one of the rooms? Yeah. Um, could it have been someone in their room with whiskey and fruit punch and like, like maybe like Jägermeister or something to produce that like herbalish type scent. It's possible. It's possible, which is why I'm saying like, you know, take it for what you will. The second thing I experienced was um, I was walking downstairs on the second day and I just wanted to grab some lunch. So I left my room and as I walked past door 442, I heard, ah. that's the best way I can define it. I couldn't tell if it was saying stop or Scott. It was a feminine voice. Um, and it's interesting because Scott, um, I, I don't know how common it was in the late 19th century, but in my, in my mind, it's not a name I hear very often. Um, and I work with hundreds of people every day and their families, and it's still not that common of a name. Um, stop to me is a little bit more believable for a sound to hear. Um, the interesting part was management, when I told them that I had just experienced this uh, in the lobby, um, I asked if there was anyone in there because I heard this and I didn't know if someone was in trouble or not or someone needed help. Um, and they confirmed that that room was completely empty. Um, they went up there and checked it. Door was locked. They had to use a key. It was completely empty untouched beds made everything. Um, so that was interesting. 
Now, could that noise have carried from another room in the hallway and just echoed in the right way and I heard it at the right moment? Yeah, sure. Is that what happened? I don't know. Um, my third experience was during the investigation. Um, and I wrote this one off as the people above me. So I'm kind of doing my rounds. When I say doing my rounds, I'm checking for recording devices. I'm checking for objects that give off EMF signals. I'm trying to figure out the best angles to put cameras in the room. Um, I have limited equipment being by myself. So like, I know there are going to be some blank spots. I want to find where they, where like the best ones are where I can just go, okay, maybe I don't put a camera here. Um, and I was, as I was doing that, one of my cases was on the couch, like fully on the couch and it just fell off. Um, I kind of got the idea that maybe something like sitting on the couch. So after that happened on, again, this is the second day. The first day I was just kind of a guest. Um, I didn't sit in the couch. I was like, okay, maybe this is a way I could communicate with whatever's here. They sit in the couch. I don't put stuff in the couch. Maybe by not sitting in the couch, I can interact with it. Um, nothing else ever came of it. It was a one time thing. So like, you know, maybe I didn't put the case on the couch as uh, securely as I thought. Like, maybe it was kind of hanging off at an angle. Um, if it was hanging off at an angle, I do know that the people in the hotel room above me, um, they were stomping around a little bit, walking heavy, what have you. Um, and there was a little bit of shakage there. You know, I experienced the same thing in my apartment, like right here with the neighbors above me. Um, in fact, to the point to where I truly think that's what caused the K2 meter to go off when I was doing my uh, possessed doll investigations uh, last month. So like I I'm open to that being a potential explanation, but again, I'm not so sure. Um, the fourth thing to happen was as I was going to sleep on the first night, again, the first night I didn't have any recordings on me. I didn't have audio on no cameras, no nothing or not anything. Um, and I swear I heard someone sitting in the bed beside me. Um, you know, I chalked it up to, it was like 1am. I'm tired. Um, I'm not, you know, 100%. My sinuses were just like building up in my forehead. Um, I was watching TV Again, there were people above me making a lot of noise um, throughout the day and evening. Like, could it have been one of them actually got up from bed and went to the bathroom or something and I just heard that? Yeah, um, I think those are all plausible explanations, but it was still weird. It was still very weird. Um, and again, it's one of those weird things I don't necessarily have proof for. So it is kind of what it is. The fourth piece is the one thing I actually believe I caught on camera. Um, and it was in the middle of the room's investigation. So I spent, I had three cameras on for about, well, two cameras on for about 12 hours, one camera going for about three. Um, I had about 36 hours of audio and, you know, I had various other recordings. I had some thermal footage. I had uh, my phone cameras footage from uh, some K2 sessions here and there. Took some flash photography. Um, but the one thing I got was I was doing an investigation. I had a K2 meter on the couch. There's a point where I put the camera down. And I'm so congested at this point. I just took some medication. I just leaned my head back and closed my eyes. And as my eyes were closed, it sounded like, and it felt like, this is the freaky part. It felt like someone got up off the couch and started walking toward me. Upon reviewing camera audio and my audio recorder, it captured the sound. Um, my camera also restarted in the middle of this. So like every 15 minutes, it restarts a new set of footage. Um, and it does a little beep, uh, when it does that. 
I have not figured out how to turn that setting off. Um, it's just something that happens. I know when that beep occurs on my audio recorder to ignore it. Um, but before that beep, you can hear the steps. You actually hear the room like creaking on the floor. Um, I didn't acknowledge it. The only thing I acknowledged was the camera beeping because that actually startled me. And I thought that maybe whatever was in the room messed with the camera. So I jolted my head up. I took a look at the camera to make sure it was still recording. And it was, um, but I never heard that audio again. A couple of other things that happened while um, collecting evidence that I didn't experience, but they happened in the room. Um, I had a K2 meter flash uh, after I closed the bathroom door to leave my hotel room. So I went to use the bathroom. Um, I closed the bathroom door to leave. When I closed the bathroom door, the K2 meter started flashing. And even after I left the room for like a minute, it just flashed at intervals, like it flashed two or three times. Um, I didn't notice it when I was in the room. I didn't notice it flash when I closed the bathroom door. Um, again, could I have closed the door hard enough to make the room or make the coffee table shake a little bit? Possibly. I don't know if it would shake enough to activate the K2 meter. Um, and I can't think of what could have possibly caused it to continue flashing for the next minute, um, that two or three times. So I don't know. Um, that's kind of all the evidence I had from there. I would love to share that with you visually and um, kind of have you see it for yourself or hear it for yourself. Um, again, I don't know how it's going to pan out. I don't know what's going to happen. What I can say, and I've said this before, is I really wish paranormal investigators who go to these places without permission, without the blessings of management, owners, etc., would kind of pull their heads out their butts and just be responsible, follow procedure, and like show respect to the spaces you're in. Um, because when you don't show that kind of respect, you kind of ruin future investigations for everyone else. Um, part of the blame is on that employee because the same employee who gave me the go ahead gave him the go ahead. And she also opened all these hotel doors cost the hotel hundreds of dollars in cleaning um, because you got to rewash the sheets that he touched. You have to rewash and re-sanitize the rooms once he left. It costs the hotel a lot of money. And that's what they're looking at when you do something like that. They don't like I paid for my room. I paid for my space. If you can't afford the space you want to investigate in, save up your money and wait. Again, does the employee have some count, uh, culpability there? Absolutely. Um, but that was too nice of a, a hotel. That was a wonderful investigation. Um, I haven't investigated a place um, to that extent. Um, gosh, since like October. Um, and... I felt like it really shook some of the rust off. I, I felt like I was uh, finding my groove again. I felt like, okay, yeah, okay, I can I can get back into this and like really uh, build some episodes and get some stuff going. And it's frustrating when that opportunity is taken away from myself, but also other paranormal investigators who might want to go to a place with so much history and those cool artifacts that are just in their cases around the hotel, sharing that public history and sharing the story of not just the hotel, but of Cheyenne of Wyoming. Um, it's a really special place. I encourage everyone to go there, not just for the hunts, but for the food, for the experience, for just surrounding yourself by that much history. It was really amazing. Um, thank you so much again for your support. Those of you who have supported us for so long, and as always, sleep tight.
here's the door.